Thank you for that. Hey guys, you already know my name, I'm Brando. And I walked around that. All the way around the outside. Anyone from anywhere near the Himalayas? Alright, well you guys probably know, lots and lots of people climb Mount Everest. Like thousands nowadays. On a single day in 2010, 106 people summited on one day. Well on the 23rd of August, 2014, I guess that's this year, I'm a bit muddled up with the dates. I was the first person in the entire world to walk the entire coastline of New Zealand. Has anyone been to the far north? Right up the top. Cape Reinga. Well, that's where I started from on the 1st of February 2013. And I made my way down the west coast. So, hit 90 mile beach and I walked and I walked and I walked some more. If you haven't been to 90 mile beach, it's 73 kilometres of nothing but beach. It's not 90 miles, they, they lied to me on the, the posters. Anyway, I walked down 90 mile beach. By the time I got to the end of it, I had successfully already changed my life. So the whole reason I set off on this big adventure was to change my life. I had headed down the wrong road, I was getting up to no good. I was headed down the wrong road with drugs, I was getting in trouble with the police, lots of trouble with mum and dad, silly things like racing my car too fast and racing it sideways too fast. But anyway, <laughs> that never ends good. So I set off on my big adventure to change everything and that's what I did by the time I got to the end of 90 mile beach. Only because it was 90 miles of nothing but beach in my own head and it made me a little bit crazy. So I got down to here and reached my first river. I didn't really think about this. The whole way around New Zealand there's rivers and there's harbours and I was like uh oh what do I do now? There's like a kilometre gap where there's this big harbour called the Whangapai Harbour coming out and I'm standing there like what do I do now? So I sat there and I was wondering what I should do and then it just kind of occurred to me I've got to get across this river so I decided I was going to try and swim. So I had flippers in my bag and a life jacket and I put the life jacket on, squeezed my flippers on which were two sizes too small and my toes were all like <coughs> Anyway, I jumped in the water and the current was just way too fast. I started going upstream so I turned around and swam straight back to the shore. So I couldn't do that. I was thinking, well, I can't be stuck here for the next 600 days. So I built a raft. I gathered all the driftwood I could, tied it together with a rope, chucked it in the water <coughs> and paddled across. The current was still too strong and this is up here in the Whangapai Harbour. The current took me way, way up, about three kilometres upstream. The sun started to set and I was in the middle of nowhere. So this was the first time I'd ever actually been lost. I was lost up this big river. I had this GPS with me and I dropped it and it was gone. So I had no way of finding out where I was when the sun set. So the sun went down and there I was, middle of nowhere, bush bashing up this hill. I get to the top and it's a beautiful night. It took me about an hour and a half in pitch black. It was the most horrible hour and a half pretty much on my whole trip. And when I got to the top, I didn't actually lose my GPS, it was just in another pocket. So I pulled it out and I realised that there's this track about 10 steps to my left the whole way up the hill where I'd been walking and it was like stairs all the way up and I just felt like an absolute idiot. <laughs> but that was an amazing moment when I did reach the top and I realised well, it's just a bit of bush. I'm sweet, set up my tent, looked at the stars all night and it was amazing. So that's what I kept on doing every time I got to a river or a harbour. This little blue spot here is the Hokianga Harbour, which is a lot bigger, a lot scarier, and some dolphins. Want to see dolphins? Go to Hokianga. So I went across there, kept on going down, and this bit here, Raipiro Beach, from here to here, is actually the longest beach in New Zealand. It's 103 kilometres long, and it is longer than 90 mile beach. And that was hell. It was horrible. It was the only thing that I saw along that whole beach was a seal and it didn't want to be my friend. <laughs> Trust me, I tried. 
So I got right down to the end of this beach and then there's the Kaipara Harbour. So the Kaipara Harbour is the biggest harbour in the southern hemisphere and the biggest harbour in New Zealand. The coastline in here is the same as the length of New Zealand. So in this little section here, there's all of that coast. So that was something I had to decide. Do I start coming inland and following the harbours and the rivers? And I decided instead of spending the next two years trying to find my way through mangroves, deep mud, watch out for the crocodiles that don't exist in New Zealand, I decided to paddle across these massive harbour mouths. So this one's about seven kilometres across and luckily I did build the raft and I did start paddling but <laughs> to my luck a fisherman came along and offered me a ride across so he took me out fishing when we went out. Anyone seen a great white shark? Well they're huge and this guy's fishing and he pulls up this great white shark it's just a little one and he didn't know what to do so he's leaning over the boat and the thing leaps out of the water takes his whole rod, snaps it in half, drops back in and here we are all like sitting there on the boat freaking out. Anyway, shark's gone, we're safe, <coughs> takes me across, thankfully alive, drops me on the other side and hey what do you know there's more beach. So I walked all the way down here to Murawai, been out there yet? Murawai Piha, well if you get the opportunity go out there it's Probably one of the most dangerous beaches in New Zealand for the surf, but it's absolutely amazing. Beautiful part of the country. So Piha, Murawai, I walked around there. I actually got rescued by a helicopter. So it was a big misunderstanding. I was walking along the rocks and I called up the surf lifeguards. That's what we have here in New Zealand and they come and rescue you if you're drowning. But I called them up and told them what I was doing and just let them know that I was about to jump in a rough bit of sea and swim across. The lady on the other end of the phone though, she thought that I was already in the water and I was somehow drowning. <laughs> With flippers on and a life jacket. So here I am on the phone, I hang up, I put on my flippers on again, got the life jacket on, I'm ready to jump in. Next thing I know, a helicopter comes shooting over the top of the cliff and this guy abseils down and stands next to me and starts giving me all these weird hand signals like I didn't speak English. I was all like, <laughs> like we're going up. <laughs> and I was like, okay. <laughs> he couldn't hear me at that stage so we got up into the chopper and my bag was still down the bottom and I was like hand signaling back because it was so loud. He put a, finally put a headset on me and I told him, you got to get my bag. And he's like, oh, it's up to the pilot, we can't get your bag. And that's like, every, that's like, that's like my bag. It's like my life. It's not actually heavy at the moment, but it's normally heavy. So this was sitting down on the rocks. And I told him, we've got to get it. It's, it's my life. It's what I'm going to be doing for the next two to three years of my life. So they eventually did go back down, picked up the bag had to actually winch the bag up, which was pretty funny. He thought he could just hold on to it, but it was too heavy for him. <laughs> so they had to winch the bag up to the top. It took me back 20 kilometers, which I had to walk further that day. Anyway, I kept on going down here, all the way past Raglan, which is pretty much New Zealand's most beautiful surf beach. Kept on going down, Whangapai Harbour. Oh, that's up the top, actually. This one here is just north of a place called King Country and King Country is where I met my first unfriendly person. He actually pulled a shotgun out, I was walking through his farm, just minding my own business, carrying my pack and I walked past this very very lush green paddock which had plants about this high growing in it, little purple flowers and it's also commonly known as dope. So I was walking past this and I thought, uh oh, I don't want to be anywhere near this. So I went straight for the coast, but this guy had already seen me. He must have been sitting up in his house just watching with binoculars or something. This guy comes racing down in his car, just north of the car fair harbour, and gets out and starts yelling at me. I'm the king of this land, king of Taharoa. And I was like, all right, I'm just minding my own business, going along my way. I had a dog with me at the time. Her name was Jess. Anyway, 
I told him why I was there because I had to walk through with this dog because it wasn't mine, I just found it. So I was walking through with this dog and he was going nuts. I kept walking and then he reaches into his car and he pulls out a shotgun. And that's when I was like, all right, all right, sweet. What do you want me to do? He tells me to get in his car and that was when I thought, well, this is gonna be over. I'm gonna die. <laughs> that's what I thought. <laughs> and anyway, he left the dog I hopped in the car, he took me 20 kilometers up the road and I had to walk for 14 hours before I came into cell phone reception again, all the way to a place called Waitomo. Anyway, the next day I came back to get the dog and unfortunately he'd taken all his anger out on the dog and shot it, which was a really, really tough time for me. It was like my only friend. I'd had it for five days and it, we'd bonded and we were best friends, but that was just a really hard time in my journey. A big part of my journey well, pretty much all of my journey was spent alone. So I was on my own all the time, trying to kind of find out who I was inside. But that also meant I was alone. So I was very lonely a lot of the time. So that dog was just an amazing thing to have with me. Anyway, I kept on going down, all the way down here. This is the king country. All the way down, eventually reaching the Taranaki Bight, which is this big bit that sticks out. I don't know why it's called a bite, because it's opposite to what a bite would look like if someone out of, out of the country. Anyway, I walked around there. That was probably one of the coolest and scariest at the same time parts of the coast. You'd be walking along all day and there'd be 30 foot cliffs above you. And then at the end of the day or at the time of the day when the tide came in, the water would get closer and closer and closer. And then eventually the water would hit the cliffs and you'd be either stuck up against the cliffs with the water lapping up to your belly or you would have successfully made it to a safe zone so somewhere where you could just climb up and chill out until the tide went out again. Thankfully I only got stuck once but just as I said up to my belly in water just hoping that the tide would go out and it did. So I kept on going down here all the way down, 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 eventually reaching the Wellington coast. So that's past Carpety Island, which is a little tiny island that's there. Carpety's famous for ice cream. I love ice cream, that's why I added that one in there. It's in Carpety. So I walked all the way down to Wellington. Wellington is where I had my first ever pig hunting experience. Has anyone ever been pig hunting? Boar hunting? Warthog hunting? Deer hunting? All right, well, if you ever get the opportunity, it's dangerous, don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I was walking around, do you guys want to hear the story about pig hunting experience? Yes. Awesome. Alright, I was camped in my little tent, this one over here. It's an MSR Hubba Hubba. Hubba Hubba. <laughs> so I was camped in that under this big beautiful karaka tree. So karaka tree, they grow to about this fat, sometimes a bit bigger, but this one was about this fat and about that tall. And they have these beautiful shiny green leaves. Anyway, I was camped under this, and the berries that grow on it are these big, yellow, juicy looking things, but they've actually got a big nut in them, so they're not tasty. So I was sleeping in my tent, it was a horrible night, super windy, super wet, super rainy, and these berries were just falling off the tree and coming down with the wind and hitting my tent like little bullets. So I was sitting there like hoping, uh oh, these, these are going to come through, I'm going to get wet. Anyway, eventually I did fall asleep and I woke up to the super strange sound in the morning. I'd never ever heard it in my whole life. Poked my head out the bottom of my tent and there were three little pigs. It's not a three little pig story. I know you're thinking that. <laughs> it's my version of one. Anyway, I burst out of my tent, started chasing them. I didn't really know what I was doing. I was chasing after these little piglets. There was one little skinny one. It was a little runt. There was one medium sized one, and that one, that was smart, and there was this fat chubby one, and it was huge, it was like this round, it was like this long, but it was like this round, <laughs> this thing was like, <laughs> so this, this fat chubby piglet I thought, that one, so I chased after it, but obviously it was fat because it was eating all the food and it was smarter than the rest, so it took off. I couldn't even keep up with it. I felt really unfit at that stage. I turn around, I'm looking for the medium sized one. And as I said, that one was smart. It was already way up the hill. But then this little one, little tiny runt, 
Didn't even know what was going on. It was just sitting there eating the berries still by my tent. So I walked up to it and it just kind of looked at me and I looked at it and I picked it up. But the second I grabbed it, this thing started squealing. All right, I need a volunteer really quickly. Someone that can squeal a little bit. <laughs> come on, come on. All right, all right, perfect. All right, I want you to give your best impression of what a pig might sound like, squealing. Okay, it's like that, but times 10. <laughs> Thanks, man. <laughs> So anyway, I'm picking up this little piglet and it's squealing and it's squealing. I don't really know what to do. I'm holding it out here, carrying it back around. I was going to go around to the other side of the tree and tie it up. So I carried it around to the tree, which is actually on this side. <laughs> I crouched down next to my tent, tied this little piglet up, went to get my knife, which I thought was in my tent, and then I realized, wait, I was chasing the big fat piglet with it. So I walked back up the hill grabbed my knife out of its pouch, walked back over to this little piglet, I crouched down next to it. Still squealing its little head off tied up to this tree, and then I looked up. Up on the hill was a big black sow. It was huge. Mama pig had come to rescue her little baby. So I jumped up, not really knowing what to do. She was coming down the hill super, super fast. I'm standing here with my knife, piglet between my legs, tree to my right, and I think, what do I do now? And I think back to when I was 11 years old. My uncle told me the most pointless life lesson I'd ever heard. If you're chased by a pig, climb up a tree. <laughs> Suddenly, it all made sense. <laughs> so I shot up the tree, faster than ever. This is gonna be my pretend tree. So I'm standing up here in the tree, sitting on the branch, looking down, and then I realize once Mama Pig's around the bottom, kind of circling, making these weird grunting noises that I am not going to try and make myself. <laughs> anyway, I'm sitting here thinking, what do I do? What do I do? And then it kind of dawned on me, I have this thing called ADHD. Has anyone ever heard of that? <laughs> Tension Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. Pretty much means I'm a breath of fresh air in everyone's life. <laughs> it also means I do things without thinking about the consequences, like leaping out of the tree onto the pig. <laughs> so that's what I did. I didn't really think about it, I just did it. I leapt out of the tree, landed on this big pig, and when you fall from about three meters, or tumble from about three meters onto a pig, its legs go like this. <laughs> So its legs went shooting out in separate directions and here I am with my knife still in my hand kind of going what do I do now. I went to stab it but I didn't know too much about pig hunting or anything so I tried to stab it in its chest. Anyway its chest has got this thick armoring, it's about that thick full of muscle and like cartilage the stuff that's in your ears. Anyway my knife only went in about this far. <laughs> so now I'm sitting on this pig with my knife stuck in it and it's angry. And it stands up with me on its back and takes off. So I was holding on for my life because I didn't want to lose my knife. I was being dragged along behind this pig for about 30 meters. And then I did eventually manage to twist my legs underneath it and roll it onto its back and mum and pig became dinner pig. But I spent, the worst part is I spent the next 20 minutes after cutting it up looking for the bacon and stuff but you actually have to make bacon it doesn't just come on the pig a butcher has to like make it in some brine so I was feeling like a dick once again looking for the bacon on my pig but I did have the sweetest tasting pork of my whole life that night has anyone got any quick questions about that situation? <laughs> what happened to the bacon? <laughs> the baby pig also became breakfast. <laughs> well, I mean, I couldn't leave the pig without a mum. Don't worry about the other ones, they're fine. But <laughs> they're still somewhere. Anyway, we've only reached Wellington, guys. Still got the rest of the coast to go. So, I got to Wellington. I thought about trying to walk on water like Dynamo. Didn't work. So, I got on a boat went across to Picton. So Picton is here in the Marlborough Sounds. The Marlborough Sounds is one of the most 
the easiest way to describe it. It's like coastline that's broken up into a thousand little pieces and it's all in here. Once again, the coastline of the Marlborough Sounds is I'm not exactly sure, but I've heard that it is 13% of the entire coastline of New Zealand is here in the Marlborough Sounds. So I decided instead of trying to walk around it, I would paddle. So after walking for 67 days, from way up here, all the way down to here, I got in a kayak and paddled for 30. So that was an adventure in itself. I'd never been in a kayak before. Didn't know how to roll. Learned pretty fast. So I got in here, paddled all the way around where I had my first really close encounter with a great white shark. So I was paddling along, and there's this friendly little seal playing underneath my boat. It kept coming up and touching its nose on my hand. It's the friendliest seal I've ever seen. Anyway, suddenly it takes off, just darts underneath my boat. And I thought that was a bit weird. Anyway, I kept paddling. Next thing I know, there's this almighty thrashing and splashing behind me and I turn around and there's this shark with like half its head out of the water with this friendly little seal in its mouth and it's thrashing around and I thought I'm next. <laughs> so if you've ever seen someone aquaplaning on a kayak it was probably me and I was paddling as fast as I could and I was like just about took off. But that was my first experience that was right up near Cook Strait in a place called Port Lagar. So I kept on going around there, eventually reaching Nelson where I started walking again up around Golden Bay through the Abel Tasman National Park which is an amazing walkway if you're ever in that part of the country go and walk the Abel Tasman walkway beautiful golden beaches, more wood pigeons than you can count on all your fingers and toes so I kept on walking from there all the way up to Farewell Spit Farewell Spit's the big bit of sand that sticks out the top of the South Island you've probably seen it on your map Anyway, from there south on the west coast was the most beautiful part of New Zealand. It is my favourite bit of coastline. It's called the Kaharangi Coast. So from about here to here, to a little place called Karamea, is just lush, lush, not coconut trees, palm trees. So there's lush palm trees, thousands of deer, big lush rivers with lots of lush water. I love the word lush. It's lush. So I kept on going down from there, absolutely amazing. I just can't emphasize how awesome it was. You've got to be there. I spent numerous days eating venison, goat, possum, which wasn't my favorite, and then lots and lots of power all along that bit of coast. So I kept on going down from there, down the west coast, eventually reaching Greymouth, then a place called Westport. Kept on going all the way down, eventually reaching a place called Haast. So Haast is the whitebait capital of New Zealand. Has anyone ever had whitebait? Well whitebaits, these little tiny white fish, they're about that big, and they've got two little eyes, and you cook them in a pan with eggs. My, my favorite recipe that I made along the way was I found these swan eggs, and they're like this big, they're huge. And I cracked them open, I had a kilo of white bait, so a whole ice cream container full of it, emptied it into a pan and cooked this massive white bait omelette thing with a swan egg, and it was awesome. So I ate that in Haast, kept on going down and into the fjordlands. So this is like nothing zone. There are parts of the fjordlands that no one has ever been, and I've been to some of them. So I walked all the way to Milford Sound where the fjordlands start to go like this. So they're really, really high and they go straight down into the sea and suddenly it becomes unwalkable. So I did consider swimming between walkable bits. By that stage I was unmentionably fit. Still am. <laughs> so I kept on going from Milford and came inland. So I came inland to Milford by kayak courtesy of Roscoe's kayaks, they came out and gave me a kayak and I paddled in. And then I walked over the Milford track. Normally I have a raft, but it got a hole in it at my last talk, so it's currently getting re repaired. I tried to paddle it along carpet too fast and it <laughs> burst. So I blew up my little raft, it's about the size of the table, a bit smaller. I sit in one end and my pack goes in the other and I started paddling across Lake Tianau. So Lake Tianau is the longest lake in New Zealand and that took me four days 
and then I got to another little lake called Lake Manapori, jumped in that, took me about half an hour, paddled across that one, and then there's a river that runs all the way from here, all the way down, and comes out here to YY Bay. So I got on my little raft, started paddling, I estimated it would take four and a half days, and at the speed of the river, I was about right. I was paddling away half an hour into this journey down the river and I heard this really faint alarm. I'd never heard the sound before. It was like an alarm, but it was, I was in a river. Why is an alarm going off in a river? Anyway, I went past these red flashing lights by a bridge. Next thing I know, has anyone seen Lord of the Rings? Yeah. Fellowship of the Ring? Well, there's a scene where there's like these water dragons and they come flying down the river and they sweep the dark riders off their horses. Well, it was kind of like that. There was a big wall of water because someone opened the dam. So that was <laughs> not fun. <laughs> so I was paddling away. I looked behind me and suddenly the alarm made sense. There's this big wall of water about three meters high. It's coming down, smacks into me and my raft, flips me out of my raft. Raft takes off and I'm bobbing in the water, slowly going down. And then I hit a willow tree. So it was all going fine, I was just bobbing along. This willow tree came up, I hit it, pulled me straight underneath the water. And at the bottom of willow trees, they have like a net root. So it's lots and lots of little tiny roots and they turn into like a net. So I got pushed up against that and held under the water. So I was sitting under the water, pinned up against this net like root system and I was fighting, I was fighting for my life trying to get off it and then all of a sudden after about 30 seconds under the water which felt like about five minutes I decided I give up, this is the end, this is how I was meant to die and I relaxed. I started gulping in water and just totally just went out of it and it was the most peaceful five seconds of my life. Well, it felt like five minutes, but peaceful five seconds of my life. I was sitting there and nothing mattered. The water was going over my skin. It was cold, but it was refreshing and it was the most amazing feeling ever. I relaxed, I started to black out. I started closing and then the next thing I remember, I popped up. So what I reckon happened is I relaxed, went limp and got pulled right down to the bottom and popped out the other side. So suddenly I was back up on the surface, vomiting up water, coughing up water, and I was alive. And it was probably the most amazing, scary, don't tell my parents moment of my life. And that was right down in the Waiau River. So now we're on the south coast of New Zealand. And let me tell you, it was really, really cold. It doesn't rain down there, it only hails. And it hailed a lot when I was there, because it was winter. So I kept on going all the way down to Bluff. Has anyone been to Bluff or heard of Bluff? No? Well, Bluff is the end of the road. Just like Cape Ranga is the end of the road at the north. It's actually the start of the road. That's the end of the road. I got to Bluff and thought, yes, halfway. Still got to walk up the other side. And I thought that was going to be like the best feeling ever, but it wasn't. About a day later, I was walking along and I see this big yellow sign. It said Slope Point, lowest point in New Zealand, latitude and longitude. It was a super windy day and it was the most amazing feeling of my life. I was like, yes, I've completed something or half of something. So I kept on walking from there into the Catlins, super, super rough. I kept on going up through Dunedin. Dunedin's like the student town of New Zealand, so lots and lots of students go there to study at university. And I got sick when I was there. I drank out of a dirty stock pond while I was coming into Dunedin because I needed fresh water. It wasn't very fresh. So I was staying with one of my friends there and I saw three couch fires. They like, like to light couches on fire there. I don't know why. <laughs> but the worst part was, is one of them was inside the house that I was in. I don't understand why they do it. And anyway, when I was leaving, uh, how long have you guys been in New Zealand? Like a year? Not a couple of months. Oh, God, don't worry. Well, about a year ago on the news, there was all these students jumping on the top of this building. And that was happening when I was in Dunedin. Anyway, there was about 30 of them on the roof of this house, and they fell through the roof. The whole roof just went, <laughs> don't try that one. <laughs> So anyway, I kept on going through the Otago Plains all the way up here. 
eventually reaching Canterbury. And the Canterbury Plains is a little town called Omaru. And that's right there. Omaru. I don't know why they call it that. But they're known for this thing called steampunk. They like make these things out of metal and they put them all together like trains and hats and stuff and they all dress up real funny. <laughs> but that's Omaru. So I had my birthday there. I turned 20. I had myself a mud cake. Didn't eat it. But it was good. That was the most lame birthday of my life. <laughs> my parents didn't even remember till the next day. So I then headed off on the most boring part of New Zealand, the Canterbury Coast, the Canterbury Plains. All it was was one big, long, straight bit of beach. And it wasn't a normal beach. It was covered in these little rocks about this big. And if it wasn't rocks about this big, then it was rocks about this big. And every step you took, about three of them went into your boots. So the whole day you were pulling your boots off putting socks out, stones out, it was horrible. But that took a week and a half of stones all the way up to Christchurch. Anyone fly into Christchurch, come to Christchurch, been to Christchurch? Awesome. Well Christchurch is here, world renowned at the moment for earthquakes, but luckily for me, I wasn't there for these earthquakes, but I was there for the old ones, which was pretty scary. So I kept on going up here. Now there's a beautiful bit of coast here and they're famous for whales and dolphins. Big, big, huge blue whales and it's called the Kai Kota Coast. Kai means, does anyone know what Kai means? Anyone learnt any Māori since they've been here? No? Perfect, awesome. Kai means food and Kota means crayfish. Food, crayfish, Kai Kota. Anyway, there was no crayfish in Kai Kota which was quite upsetting to me because I love greyfish. So I did get to go out on the boat while I was there and got to see the most amazing whales I've ever seen in my whole life. All you get to see them though is like this big tail that comes out and that's what this big whale does. Super amazing though. So I kept on going up through Blenheim back up to Picton where I started the South Island League and that was another huge milestone for me. I felt like I'd completed well, I had. I'm the first person who has ever walked around the entire coastline of New Zealand. And that moment, it kind of hit me. Wow, I'm, I've got to finish now. <laughs> so I came across and I had this big welcome in Wellington. They had these, this big mouldy welcome where they had a haka for me. And that was just as I came in off the inter-islander boat. So I then went on, after spending a few days there in Wellington, all the way down to this little place called Nawi, right down here at the bottom. So Nawi is probably one of the coolest places because they have all these tractors. There's thousands of tractors and they've all got these faces painted on them. One's called Tinky Winky and Dipstick and wait, there's Teletubbies. <laughs> well anyway, um, I was watching that earlier. I've got little kids, a sister and brother. Anyway, I got to there and Nawi was amazing. The hospitality of the Nawi we ins those parts of the country. I don't know what they're really called, but the people there are absolutely amazing. So anyway, from there, I kept on going up the Wire Rapper Coast. Now the Wire Rapper Coast is absolutely amazing for its lush, once again lush, beautiful seafood. So there's absolutely amazing crayfish, kinna, power. Has anyone ever seen a kinna? Right, well a kinna's a sea egg, so it like, looks like an egg but it's got spikes all over it and inside there's these little orange bits of roe and they're absolutely amazing. So I was eating them all the way up, eventually reaching Hawke's Bay. So Hawke's Bay is this big bay here and I started following a rail railroad track along that. So I followed this railroad track and I followed it, it was meant to only take a day, but I ended up actually following it from here all the way around, all the way out to this place called Mahia Peninsula and then all the way up into Gisborne. Along that railroad tunnel, well sorry, along that railroad there's a tunnel. Anyway, this tunnel is the longest railroad tunnel in New Zealand and I spent four and a half hours walking through it. Hitch black. Super scary. I thought the whole time that there was going to be a train. Anyway, I get to the other end of it. It's definitely going to be no train because there's no railroad. It comes out of the tunnel to a cliff where obviously a big landslide has come down and just taken out everything. It looked like a roller coaster. The railroad track went whew, 
and just disappeared into the mud. So I was suddenly realised I'm safe and I can keep walking to Gisborne. So I reached Gisborne and started walking up around East Cape. The whole time I was walking I got told that Gisborne's a scary place, East Cape's even scarier. But when I got there some of the nicest people in New Zealand are from East Cape. So they helped me out all the way around until I eventually reached Whakatane, made my way up to Tauranga and then into the Coromandel. Has anyone managed to get out to the Coromandel? Yes. Cathedral Cove? Yes. Hot Water Beach? Yes. Awesome. Well, I walked all the way around there, got to Hot Water Beach, it was about 11.30 at night, had the most awesome hot pool under the moon, super cold but super amazing. Kept on going around Cathedral Cove all the way up to the top of the Coromandel Peninsula, which is right up the top there. And I thought, yes, I can see Auckland. But you can see Auckland from the top, you still have to walk all the way down to the Firth of Thames. So that took an extra two weeks, all the way around and eventually to Auckland, which is where we are now. So about two months ago, I was walking through Auckland and they let me walk over the Harbour Bridge. So that was really, really cool. I got to walk right over the top of it and then down the other side and continued along all the way up to Whangaparaua. So from Whangaparaua, there's this big military zone along the end of it. You can walk right around the outside. Didn't think I'd see seals that close to Auckland, but if you want to see seals, they're pretty close to here. Just go to Whangaparaua Peninsula. I kept on going up all the way up to Whangarei. So Whangarei Heads is these massive, massive mountains. And they are really, really cool. So big, huge rocks. They go straight up out of the sea, and on the top of them, they just go to like sharp, sharp points. So I'll show you guys a photo in a second of me standing on top of one of these points, like 200 meters above the sea, just whew, straight down. It's pretty awesome. It was really scary. So anyway, from there, I kept on going up. Has anyone been to the far north? So this section, long golden beaches. Sweet. Well, I got to the far north, Doubtless Bay all the way around, all the way up to North Cape. So I've actually got a little map here, because I wrote on it, and it says beautiful, because it was beautiful. This is the map that I carried with me. It's the only way I knew that I was going in the right direction. So I got up to North Cape, and I was treated with wild horses, I was swimming with dolphins, it was absolutely amazing. When I say I was swimming with dolphins, I went swimming when I got back in I realized the dolphins were swimming with me but I didn't know until I got back in and looked at my camera so that was kind of special so I got up there and reached the last day of my journey it's day 599 so it took me 600 days to walk the entire coastline of New Zealand and right back up to the top so day 599 was a pretty scary feeling it was like this big low so I had been on a high all the way around the coast being super happy super amazed and I reached the end and it was like well tomorrow it's all over I thought the end was going to be amazing and spectacular and it was but it, in its own special way so that was a very very strange hard time and right at the start I said right at the start that I was going to go and swim in the sea so I got to the top and I, had, I was mic'd up because I was on TV and I took the mic off and I said, just got to go guys. Took the mic off, started running down, just dove into the water. And then when I got back up, I quoted myself. <laughs> and I said, with this swim, I've washed away my past. From now on, I'm into the future. So that was the quote that's kind of taken me and that's the one that I run my life by now. And like... The only thing that was keeping me going along this way was just knowing, well not knowing, what was around the next corner. So I'd get to a beach and I'd look down the other end of it and suddenly there'd be this rocky outcrop and I wouldn't have a clue what was coming. I didn't know what was going to be around that corner at the end of the beach. So that was what kept driving me. When I reached the end I was like, wow, this is the last corner, I know what's on the other side of that. And that was just a super spectacular feeling. Anyway. I'm going to start playing these. You can just have a look at them while I'm talking. All right, I'm going to show you some of my gear. 
I lived off the land while I was walking and this is one of the tools, that's a deer, but it's the wrong way up. So this was one of the pieces of equipment that I used. I'm not actually going to shoot it, don't worry. Well, this is my bow and arrow and I used that to hunt pretty much the whole way around the coast of New Zealand. I hunted for things like pigs, deer, possums, rabbits, birds, not cats or dogs, although sometimes they look tasty. I ate things like bugs, lots of different bugs, wetters, don't eat wetters, they're the most disgusting thing out there. I also ate one little seal, not that one, don't worry. So this is the other means of hunting I used, was a spear. So I used this for small vermin, fish, pretty much anything in the water. The only thing on land was a frog, which was my vermin, which didn't have fur. So that's what I used to hunt in the sea. I also carried uh, a first aid kit, which is probably the most important thing. I had to stitch myself up once because I was trying to be cool. There's some girls walking with me. I was chopping up a branch for a fire and I missed the branch and hit my arm. So I had to give myself three stitches with a bit of fishing line and a needle, which was not very pleasant. So that was, thankfully I was carrying that one. That's Kinna for you. So anyway, I also mentioned it before, I carried a GPS. So when I didn't lose it, or it wasn't in the wrong pocket, this is pretty much the way I knew that I was going in the right direction when I was in forests. I also need another volunteer really quickly. Someone that's like real brave. Really, really brave. Come on. Alright, go stand over there. Sometimes you gotta, um, there's like these... Alright. Alright. Okay, just... just it's actually an EPIRB. It's a personal locator beacon, don't worry man. <laughs> does look like a taser though. That's like the number one guess that I get when I pull this one out. What is it? Taser! But it's not. This is a personal locator beacon. So pretty much this is my lifeline on the coast or in the bush, in the wild. So if I set this off, hopefully a helicopter will come and get me. I've never actually had to try and use it so I don't know if it works. But that's what it's meant to do. That goes along with survival gear. So this is my sleeping bag. Nice. It's actually my bivy bag. But pretty much if I ever get really wet and really cold and start getting hypothermic, I hop inside this. It's a tin foil bag and it regulates my body heat. I also have, you don't see one of these? Well, when I went to light fires. I didn't always have a matches, matches and my lighters were often wet. So I get the little, the flint and the steel and I spark it. And so that sparks away, the sparks fall off, don't worry it's not going to hurt. <laughs> so the sparks come flying down onto my fire, I give it a few blows and flames, we have fire. Okay. This one I use to catch eels lots of times. See how the end's frayed? If you're ever going to catch an eel, pretty much if you fray the end of your rope, an eel will come along. They've got thousands of little teeth that point backwards. A stocking is another good one to catch an eel. Put that in the water, the eel will come along, start biting at it, and if you pull it up, it gets tangled in the eel's teeth and you can just yank it out. So that's how I caught eels. All right. Okay, don't laugh at this one because it's serious. It's not what you think. Wait. Okay, this is a condom. <laughs> Just wait. <laughs> in a, in a, <laughs> this can save your life. <laughs> wait. <laughs> wait. <laughs> Alright, if, if you need water and you've got no means of carrying it, I mean a t-shirt won't hold it, this can hold 20 litres of water before it pops. I mean I've tried it, 20 litres of water. So. It's a good thing to carry in the bush, on your own. <laughs> so, has anyone seen one of these before? It's not one of those crazy ninja things that are like... It's actually a saw. It's kind of one of those crazy ninja things. But this saw can cut through just about anything. It's got little diamonds all over it. Can cut through trees. Can cut through metal. But that's what I use that for. 
got some little emergency fire starters and also these are like the coolest things ever they look like fireworks actually just matches but they're waterproof matches you can light them and put them under water and they won't go out um, as you can see I didn't use them very much because I had my flint but that was just in an emergency all right that's pretty much all the gear I've got that's my tent this is my pack her name's Lady tell you a bit about Lady uh, I've had three packs throughout my journey I had one which was called pack and one that was called Bob it wasn't Bob it was Jenny it was Jenny Bob was my boots <laughs> I had lots of friends <laughs> so I was walking along one day with Jenny on my back and anyway I put her down and she broke her back so I put her down and she snapped in half and was horrible and then I was searching everywhere for a new one but nothing could replace Jenny Jenny was just an amazing pack and then I walking through I think it was Wellington the second way up and I looked into this window and there she was a younger model lady so that's what I got and that's what I've had ever since Wellington so this is the this is the pack that's taken me from Wellington all the way up to Cape Ranger again and that was that was a long way for a pack to go anyway I wear scarper boots I've been through four pairs sounds like a lot but each pair of boots this is my boots so my scarper boots lasted me from each pair lasted about 3,000 kilometers which is a long way if you think about 3,000 kilometers that's longer than the length of New Zealand that's from here to Sydney so 3,000 kilometers is quite a long way so pretty much when I got to the top I got this big sign and it said Wild Boy Adventures Trail and if you ever got to Cape Ranga you might have seen it while you're up there if you've only been here for a month and there's this big sign that said Wild Boy Trail and that's my trail and that's around the entire coastline of New Zealand so before I do ask you guys some questions I did bring along some local delicacies and how many 40 roughly yeah, you can all try one Which one? Do you, the darker ones or the lighter ones? Just any. They're all good. Which one's your favourite? Uh, the lighter ones. The lighter ones? <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> not bad. Okay, you just pass them around. The you can eat as many as you want. Oh, yeah. Alright. Don't worry, they are safe. Ish. Alright, while you guys are passing them around, has anyone got any questions for me? Where are you from? Where am I from? I mean, not there. I'm from Auckland, so I'm from the North Shore, which is on just on the other side of the bridge. And I grew up there in a little place called Albany. It's actually really big now. You, oh yeah. Um, how did you record everything? Was it what camera? Um, well, I had an iPhone, which I took quite a lot of my photos. I took all of my own photos that you can see up here. I also have a website, um, Wild Boy Adventures, Brando Yalovich, that's my Facebook but just wildboy.co.nz is my website all of my photos were taken with either an iPhone or a GoPro so as you can probably see in some that's the roller coaster that's what I reached at the end of the tunnel <laughs> you're welcome to a mint also <laughs> alright so <laughs> Well, throughout my whole life, I did have a dream to go on a great big adventure and I really wanted to do something that no one else had ever done and I was going down the wrong road in life and it suddenly dawned on me this is the perfect opportunity to go out and conquer my own Everest and live my own dream so that's what I did I realized that 
if I don't do it now, it's never going to happen and I'm going to end up in the wrong road and end up in lots of trouble. So it's kind of both. Mm. Uh, what kind of preparation did you do before the journey, like, um, you know, how to slaughter pigs and stuff? All right, well, the preparation I did, I grew up in the city, so as a city boy, I didn't know too much about hunting, fishing, or anything along the lines of that. But I didn't prepare at all. Not at all. The only preparation, I, pre, pre, the only preparing I did was I bought this map, this one, and I, th I said to myself. In fact, I said to all my friends, they were all over at my house. I said, in 2013, I'm going to walk around here, and they were like, yeah, right, whatever, whatever. And then, like three weeks later, I left and started walking and didn't stop. But the only preparation I did was kind of look at a few maps online. And the reason I did that was because I wanted to walk into the unknown. I didn't want to know what was going to be around that corner. I wanted to just keep on walking and let the universe take care of me. Is there anything that you wish you had really done differently um, in retrospect? Hmm, differently. Carried food. I didn't actually carry food, or well, very much food, along the way. I hunted for all my own food and when I wasn't hunting for food I was either being fed by people that I met along the way or I was eating rice with salt water which is never good. Good question. I took all my own photos some of the ones that you see here, I've balanced my camera in a tree or I've set it up on a rock and put it on a timer and run back in front of it and like strike a pose. And then all the selfies, like that one, they're all taken by me. But that was, um, that's how I do those ones. Do you have sponsors or people helping with all this? I only had one sponsor. Well, I had two. One was my dad. <laughs> the other one was Scarpa, who sponsored me my boots. So that's why I had um, four pairs of boots and they didn't cost me anything, otherwise they're quite expensive. But yeah, Scarpa helped me out. Throughout my, my whole journey along the way, I wasn't just doing it for myself. I decided that it was also a great opportunity to give back. So I was raising money for the Ronald McDonald House. Just yesterday, or the day before, I went and gave them a check for $32,000. So that's how much money I raised on my own all the way around the coast for the Ronald McDonald House. Do you guys know what the Ronald McDonald House does? Kinda, yeah. Well, the Ronald McDonald House is an organization that helps the families of sick children. So any child that gets sick up to the age of 21, it's not a child anymore, but up to the age of 21, they will look after their families. They give them somewhere to stay, food to eat, pretty much give them facilities that are right next to the hospital so that they don't have to travel long distances to see their loved ones that are in hospital undergoing treatment. So that's what the Ronald McDonald House does and that's who I raise money for. How much hunting and like, experience did you have on like, blend knowledge and stuff going in? Um, well, you said the pig thing, but like bow and arrow and, and gathering. Well, I had no idea how to shoot a bow and arrow. Um, I knew how to shoot a 22, but I didn't carry one of them, so it wasn't very useful. Um, I'd hit a possum in my car, but that was about the hunting experience that I've had. The plant knowledge, I had no idea. You might have seen a photo of these really nice looking berries on here. They're really poisonous. <laughs> Don't eat them. So I found that, that out the hard way because I didn't really know too much about what I was doing and I was just eating whatever. New Zealand's a pretty safe country. You can eat just about anything and be alright. <laughs> so I was eating these berries and I felt really, really ill and that's when I decided I needed to get some knowledge. So I bought this book called Native Edible Plants and then from then on I pretty much referred to everything back to my book. So hopefully I didn't end up in a ditch somewhere. Yep. Yeah, I carried a crossbow with me as well. That weighed about four and a half kgs, so it was quite a lot of weight to be carrying, as well as my bag, which normally was around 38. Uh, so I decided to go for a lighter option. That was right back in the start when I had the crossbow. No, no, I sent it back home in, <laughs> in a parcel. What else did you have in your bag that you found like, you should use other than that stuff? 
Um, yeah, yeah. Well, I carried solar panels and batteries, which is why it was really, really heavy. But the most important part of all my equipment was my knife. Definitely my knife. So this is the knife that took me the whole way around. Um, I lost it once, but then I found it again. Well, actually, someone else found it again and sent it to me, which was pretty cool. Um, but this is the most important thing you should carry into a bush. It doesn't have to be that big. It's just really cool. <laughs> Oh, look, okay, two more pictures. We'll, uh, we'll get a question and I'll tell you. Anyone got another question? What was the highest point? The highest point? Um, 400 metres. <laughs> 400 metres, and that was down in um, Milford Sound. Is that it? Yep, um, I wrote pretty much every single day and posted to Facebook. So if you go onto my Facebook page, uh, you can actually go right back to day one where I made a daily post. I did a quite, quite a lot of video blogs as well. Um, I also obviously took a lot of photos. I'm planning on writing a book by mid next year. So hopefully I'll have a book by mid next year and I'm also starting a TV, TV series. So with all my footage I can do that with. Uh, is your TV series just about your experience or is it you helping other people do the trail or is it? Um, it's pretty much going to be about taking high class businessmen or celebrities. <laughs> that one? Oh, that's, that's a dead seagull. <laughs> it's a seagull carcass and that's it cooked. <laughs> <laughs> So it's going to be about taking celebrities or high class business people out into the bush, breaking them down, pulling back the layers and finding out how they got from wherever they started to where they got to and showing New Zealand and showing people that anything is possible and everybody started from nothing. So that's going to be what the wild boy experience is all about. Did you bring pans along with you to cook things or did you acquire them along? I kind of acquired them along the way. I started with this one little scan pan and it was like this big. I tried cooking everything in it. Sometimes they're a little too big. Like a whole goat doesn't fit into a scan pan. Um, yeah, of all the people you, you met along the way, are there any like, specific ones? I met hundreds and hundreds of people throughout my journey. Um, I can't really put a finger on one person particularly, but the hospitality throughout New Zealand was absolutely amazing. It was something that I did not even foresee coming. So when I left, I thought, I'm going to be on my own all the time. And I was at first. Every single day I woke up and I walked on my own. But then I started meeting people and they started talking to their friends and family. And eventually I found it hard to not <coughs> stay in my tent or to stay in my tent. So the people around New Zealand restored my faith in humanity. People are amazing. And that's what it opened my eyes to. So everyone is amazing. Okay. Um, when you when you started your journey, did you know that you wanted to be a paddle and stuff? Where did you like acquire boats and did you get your pack wet? Yeah, I got my pack wet wet heaps and heaps. Uh, the way I got boats across was by flagging people down. Help me. <laughs> pretty much the way I did it. Uh, sometimes I had organisation like the Lions or the Rotary, they would get behind me when I got to their town and they'd help me out. So they'd call up all their friends and say, can anyone help him? And that's how I kind of got around was the hospitality and generosity of New Zealanders. Like the, the, the time that you were in a kayak, did you like, return the kayak? Yeah, yeah. So the kayak was lent to me by a guy called Pip in Picton and he he let me use it and then he came and picked it up from Nelson. It was only like a 20 minute drive, but it took 30 days in a kayak. <laughs> Did you go into this expecting to become such a big icon or like have like a, a name like Wild Roy and have like a following? Not at all really. Um, it kind of 
it kind of dawned on me on the last day that my life's never going to be the same. Uh, the last day I realised when I, when I step over that start point or that end point, I'm a new person. So suddenly I go and talk to people all the time and I have a name for myself. I can't do anything wrong. But it, it's changed my life, but not in a bad way. Um, I didn't foresee it coming at all though. I thought, hey, I'm just going to walk around and go back to normal. <laughs> But it didn't happen like that at all. Uh, were there times when you felt you couldn't go any further? And if there were times like that, what kept you motivated? Um, there was definitely lots and lots of times where I just felt like giving up. And there were moments where I'd just break down and completely lose my emotions. I'd cry for my mum. Believe it or not, I cried out loud for my <laughs> mum. And that's that's what I kind of did. I just released all that emotion. I just had to get it out because if I stored it in there, when it did eventually come out, it would have been absolutely terrible. But it was the little things that kept me going, like this, a massive random cathedral, or going and getting my own food, or waking up to the most beautiful sunrise I've ever seen. It was just the little things that kept me going and kept reminding me that what I was doing was a lifetime opportunity. Uh, well, the only thing that was hard to do was go to the bathroom. <laughs> that was like the hardest thing in a kayak. But I just paddled to shore and set up my tent every night. And there was one night that I had to sleep in the kayak and I woke up with the sorest back ever because I had to like put my back over this random hard bit of plastic. But yeah, it's pretty much how I did it. Where did you get the sheep that's in these photos that you have like, on the leash? <laughs> Alright, well the sheep, its name was Betty. <laughs> and it was my friend for a day. So I was walking along the Canterbury coast, that really boring bit that I was talking about. There's nothing but those little pea gravels and stones, but there was also this sheep. So I came across this sheep that had fallen off the cliffs and it had so much wool that it mustn't have hurt it. It just must have tumbled down and was stuck. <laughs> so it was stuck down the bottom, it had nothing to eat, it was starving. And anyway, I thought I'd do a good deed and take it up the hill and give it to some random farmer. So I started carrying it for a while and it got too heavy so I put it down and I tied it up with a rope and it started dragging me along for half the day. And then I got to the end of the day I tied it up outside this cave that I was sleeping in and I was lying there with my little fire. The sheep was looking at me and I was looking at the sheep. <laughs> sheep looked back at me and I thought dinner. <laughs> So the sheep didn't go to a farmer, but it went to a good cause. <laughs> so that was Betty. Long live Betty. <laughs> Do you have like a certain date where you wanted to finish, or was it just like, kind of took it casually, like took a day off and just sat around? Um, well, I just, I didn't have a clue. I had no time frame. Um, I did not have any idea how long it was going to take me. Uh, it was pure luck. like six and six hundred chance of it landing on six hundred days and I didn't have a clue that it was going to be that until the day before so no plan whatsoever with days or time frames the only time I ever set a time frame for myself was at the beginning of each day I looked at my map and thought right I'm going to get to that location by the end of today and that's what kind of kept me going rather than just waking up I'm just going to stay here for the next rest of my life <laughs> awesome I'll answer three more Heaps and heaps. Uh, this was given to me, it's Ponamu or Greenstone, it was given to me by my mum and dad. When I was walking around the East Cape, uh, I met this random guy. He was walking along the road. I was walking along the beach and he pointed at me. He's got full facial tattoos, moku. And anyway, he points at me and says, that's my Ponamu. And I'm like, uh-oh. So I start taking it off because I think he's going to like, fight me for my Greenstone. <laughs> so I start taking it off and he starts saying, no, I carved that. And most random guy ever, mum and dad bought it from Auckland. And this guy walking along the road in the middle of nowhere says, that's mine and I carved it. And it was just the most amazing feeling. And it was at a time that I really needed a sign that what I was doing was, was right. And it was just the perfect sign for me that the universe was still looking after me. Are you 
Yes. <laughs> Does this make you want to branch out and do any other massive journeys in different parts of the world? Kiwi for life? Are you, do you have all sorts of things going on? Well, I've definitely got a huge dream to explore and see the world. Uh, with the Wild Boy Adventures, I'm hoping to take that overseas so that I can travel for free and uh, make a TV show about it. But I've got this huge, big idea. It's just an idea. And I want to walk from the South Pole all the way to the North Pole in a straight line. And there's some pretty dangerous parts to walk through, but I reckon that would be absolutely amazing experience and would continue with my name and help me to get where I want to go. Pretty much where I want to go now is I want to be in the position where I have a voice that I can voice to a nation rather than just a small group of people. At the moment a small group of people is great um, and hopefully I can inspire a lot more people with my actions and my words. <laughs> but, uh, did you have, was there any other um, companions, companions that you had along the way? Um, I think there's a photo up here of me with this little tiny stoat and it's about this big, it's like a weasel and it was my friend for a day as well. No, don't worry, I let that one go in a dock trap. I let it go in a trap because they're pests. But yeah, I had a few little I had a ladybug for about 10 minutes once when I was sitting down having lunch and I talked to it. <laughs> Bit crazy. <laughs> awesome. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed what I've come here to share with you today. I'm going to leave you guys with a quote. And that's, live your dreams no matter what. The only person that can stop you from living your dreams is yourself. Make your own luck. Thank you.